Hi everybody, welcome to Inspirited Live. I'm John Spellman, and today we're going to be talking about the Sermon on the Mount. Let's just begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the blessing and being able to study your word tonight, to study one of the most famous sermons ever preached. We pray that you will bless us and help us, Lord, to understand the truths that are there for us to know and to apply to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, before we get started talking about the lesson, I want to talk to you a little bit about how you can participate in tonight's program. There are a couple of ways that you can do that. The first way is by web camera. So if you're on uh, watching us through the Uvu software, um, all you have to do is just uh, log into our Bible study conference. Just call Inspirited Network on Uvu, and then you'll be logged into our Bible study conference, and we'll be able to see each other and talk to each other face to face. So this quarter, we're studying the book of Matthew. And um, this week, we're going to be looking specifically at the Sermon on the Mount, one of the most popular sermons ever preached. You know, there's, there's so many fans of the sermon for, uh, that, that don't even have to be Christian. Uh, so this sermon has impacted not just the lives of those who are religious, but those who are uh, maybe not religious or those who have had, um, you know, uh, movements of uh, activism or um, major reforms. Uh, I, I, one per such person who was a popular fan um, of the Sermon on the Mount was Mohandas Gandhi. Now, Mohandas Gandhi never actually became a Christian, but he was a, a very big fan of the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, uh, there was actually a movie about Gandhi that was uh, released years ago. He said, you know, uh, to uh, his Christian friend, you know, your Jesus I like, it's the Christians I, I take issue with. Um, and so Mohandas Gandhi was a very, very big fan. He had uh, read the Sermon on the Mount and was moved by it. Uh, and so uh, Jesus uh, had influenced a lot of what he had done uh, in India through his message. Um, <clears throat> so the Sermon on the Mount is one of the most popular and most influential sermons uh, ever to have been spoken. We're going to take a look at uh, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 28 and 29 for a moment, which says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So in other words, not as the scribes and not as the Pharisees. So Back then, it's amazing to see that the people were spellbound by his words. They were, they were captivated. They, they um, you know, were amazed by his teaching. And today, this same sermon still inspires people and moves them and amazes them today. So, <clears throat> when we look at the book of Exodus, uh, we see that God had led the children of Israel out of Egypt. He baptizes them in the Red Sea. And then he brings them into the wilderness for about 40 years. And he worked signs and wonders amongst them, and then they, uh, and then he met them personally on the mountaintop where he gave them his law. When we look at the experience of Jesus, we see something very similar. So we see that Jesus uh, came out of Egypt, was baptized in the Jordan River, uh, was out in the wilderness for forty days, and remember that uh, there's that scripture that says, "I have appointed thee each day for a year." Uh, so we see that Jesus was in the wilderness for forty days, just like the Israelites were in the wilderness for forty years. He worked signs and wonders, and then he met, uh, he was able to meet with the people of Israel personally on the mountaintop where he amplified God's law. So a lot of similarities, a lot of parallels exist when we compare the ministry of Jesus and the experience of the children of Israel. Um, we're going to start with uh, taking a look at Matthew chapter 5, looking at the beginning of, of that sermon and seeing what we can get from that. So we're looking at Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to take a look at Jesus' sermon and uh, see what exactly it is that he said that was so powerful and so moving to all these people. So, verse 3 starts with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you, falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth, it is thenceforth good for nothing, 
but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. So here Jesus makes these connections between being blessed even while you're in the midst of hardship. So my first question to you, what about these words might have seemed so radical to the people that Jesus was talking to? Why are these words so radical? Why was he able to captivate such a large audience by saying these things? What are your thoughts? Um, I want to make a few comments about what might have caught the, the, uh, the listeners off guard as they heard Jesus speak these words. Now, if you notice here at the beginning of this sermon, he starts off talking about how people are blessed in situations where they would not have felt blessed. They would not have felt like things were going their way. They would not have felt favored by God. So he mentions that, you know, look at the people that he mentions are blessed. He talks about the poor in spirit, those who are mourning, and of course mourning is like, you know, when you're crying, when you're really upset, uh, or like, you know, if you're mourning the loss of a loved one. Uh, he talks about people who are meek, people who are in hunger and thirst. Uh, he talks about people who are merciful, people who are pure in heart, uh, people who are peacemakers, people who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And then he says that, you know, you're blessed even if people revile you and persecute you. Now, these are, if, if you keep in mind that this is in the context of the Roman Empire, a time uh, of oppression in, uh, in Israel's history, then you know that Jesus' words would have caught them by surprise because people who were being uh, mistreated and persecuted, uh, people who were trying to stand up for doing what's right and being persecuted for, for standing up for what they believed in, would not have felt like they were blessed as they were being persecuted. So Jesus seems to make this contrast of being blessed even when you experience hardship in the here and now. And so he was pointing people to a greater time, a greater reward, uh, to, to greater times that would come and that God would reward those um, who were suffering now for the right reasons. So he talks about, first of all, being poor in spirit. Uh, in other words, being humble, being uh, you know, broken before God. Uh, he, he mentions here that God would reward them because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, he talks about people who are mourning now. Uh, they will be comforted. So you, you see here, for example, that you know, this idea of, of, of being in mourning, people who are, who are sorrowful, wouldn't feel like they were blessed and like anything was going in their favor. Um, but here Jesus points out that if you're mourning now, you're going to be blessed. And elsewhere, when you look at um, where he begins to talk about this contrast between those who uh, mourn now but are comforted later versus those who are uh, who have their comfort now or their consolation now but will mourn later. So he's basically pointing out that people who are doing wrong things, people who are doing wicked things, may appear like they're getting away with it in the here and now. They may appear like everything's going their way and like they're prospering. But there's going to come a time in which God will judge and God is going to deal with the unrighteousness of the wicked. And those who suffered as a result of uh, standing up uh, for their beliefs or those who, who, who uh, were determined to do what's right and to live for God and, and to suffer for righteousness' sake, those individuals would be rewarded even if in the here and now they were uh, going through persecution. Let's see that we have a comment coming in, so let me just go ahead and uh, grab that. It says here, I think that the people had a different expectation of what type of people are blessed. Also, the Israelites might not have thought of themselves as the light or salt uh, preservatives of, of the, uh, to the earth. Oh, represent, sorry, representatives uh, to the earth. Okay, that's a, that's a very good point, you know, and that's uh, pretty much in line with what I've been saying, that, you know, the idea that you would experience these things and you're blessed because of it was foreign to these people. You know, people didn't feel blessed. Imagine, you know, you're going through hardship. You're, maybe you're mourning the loss of a loved one. And somebody tells you, okay, if you're mourning now, you're blessed. You know, and you're sitting there in your, in your hardship, and you're like, I don't feel too blessed. But Jesus assured them that they would be blessed and that they would be comforted. Maybe not here and now. Maybe they might go through this difficult experience in the here and now, but that didn't mean that they were not going to be blessed uh, later. And so he promises them that, even though in the Christian experience you go through difficulty and suffering, God is going to reward that, di that uh, difficulty that you went through, uh, and he's going to bless you in the latter end. And so he was pointing them to hope that suffering is only but a blip in eternity. It's only in the here and now. But there's going to come a time when God is going to take care of the things that you're going through and that he's going to reward you for your patience and for your trust in him. 
in this time period, it would have been easy for people to say, you know what, forget about God. Everybody else who does the wrong thing seems to be prospering. So let me just go ahead and join them so I can prosper too and not go through difficulty. But the problem is that if a person took that mindset, yeah, they would be having a good time in the here and the now, but then as far as eternity was concerned, they could be lost. And so they would suffer the judgment and the wrath of God as opposed to suffering now for but a moment in history and then enjoying eternity uh, with the rewards of heaven. And so Jesus was basically showing them that they needed to be patient. They needed to put their hope in eternity rather than focusing only on the here and the now. Because even if you were going through hardship now, that didn't mean that God wasn't going to bless you in the long run. And so he, he, he points to the difficulty that people were going through and gives them hope. Then he goes on to say in um, the last part that we read, he calls them the salt of the earth. Now, notice here that he says to them, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you. Anytime you take a stand for doing what's right and you stand for Jesus and you, and you, and you stand for biblical truth, people are not going to like you. They're going to they're gonna persecute you. They're, they're going to have a hard time with you because the world likes for, the, for people to conform and to do what the world does. And so when you refuse to, to conform, you become a target. And when you become a target, God's, uh, God often... Um, will reward you for it in the end, but in the here and now, you're going through difficulty. Um, and that can take many different forms. You know, some, sometimes it's not always physical persecution where somebody's throwing you in jail or where somebody's, you know, uh, doing you physical harm or putting you to death. Sometimes it can be just, you know, hardship that you face with your family, you know. Uh, because you choose to keep God's commandments, your family doesn't want to talk to you anymore. Uh, your friends may not want to be with you anymore. They may say you're no fun. You know, because you take your stand for God, the world may consider you strange. They may not like your teachings or your belief system that you hold to because they, they want you to follow the ways of the world. Um, and Jesus said himself, you know, if you were of the world, the, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, uh, therefore the world hates you because it hates me. So Jesus pointed out that when you take your stand and you're going to do uh, what God wants, uh, when you're going to live righteously, and you're, going to, and you're going to keep God's commandments, the world is not going to appreciate that. And so you will go through hardship. In fact, uh, uh, the Bible t tells us that all who will live godly must go through per or must su will suffer persecution. But he promises that even if that happens, even if you go through a difficult experience, um, if, you will, if, you, if you are persecuted and reviled for his name's sake, even if people speak evil against you and accuse you falsely, uh, rejoice and be exceedingly glad because your reward is great in heaven. And he points out also, which is really interesting in verse 12, that this is nothing new. See, a lot of people think that when they go through difficulty in their Christian experience, that this is something new and they're surprised by it. But when you read throughout scripture, the prophets had gone through the same thing. Uh, one of the most famous that we've talked about uh, months ago is, is Jeremiah. Jeremiah, when he began to preach the word of God, the, the people were treating him terribly. You know, and so he got so discouraged at one point that he was like, you know what, I'm not going to speak in God's name anymore. I'm not going to prophesy. Uh, you know, they, these people are telling me to report and they will report it. So if I speak in the name of the Lord, uh, they're going to go report it and I'm going to have trouble. So you know what, I just won't speak in God's name anymore. Uh, they're on their own. But then God's word was in him like a consuming fire and he couldn't hold it back. He began to preach God's word in spite of the consequences that he would face in the secular world. And today, the things that are going on in, in, in regard to all kinds of things that happen in this world, um, we're seeing that it's unpopular sometimes to follow Christ when the world is, is headed on one direction and the, and the church is headed in a different direction. And so it can be unpopular to hold certain beliefs. But Jesus is saying here that even if you go through hardship and persecution and people accusing you of things, uh, because you speak in my name, your reward will be great in heaven. Then he goes on to use this analogy of, of, uh, of salt on the earth. And we know that salt is a preservative. It, it's often used to preserve things. And uh, as his representatives, he calls us salt of the earth. And that salt's purpose is to give things flavor, right? And so if, if salt doesn't have the flavor in it anymore and you pour it on your food, it's good for nothing. It doesn't do anything for your food. The only thing it's good for is to just basically be thrown out. And so Jesus says here that you guys are 
meaning us, we are the salt of the earth. His followers are the salt of the earth. But if that salt no longer has that flavor, then it's not good for anything. Then he uses another analogy, and he calls them the light of the world. And he points out that light isn't meant to be hid. Uh, we use light in dark places to illuminate so that we can see. So nobody who has a light is going to hide the light so that nobody can see it. When you have a light, chances are you want to illuminate something, and so that light needs to be visible. And so he's giving his, his followers encouragement. He wants them to be the light of the world. He wants them to shine, not hide in darkness, not, not uh, put out their light. He wants people to see the light. Um, and then he wants us to have that, that sweet flavor and not to lose sight of it. Isn't it true that it's sometimes difficult not uh, to, to, to keep our savor when the world doesn't want us to, uh, to flavor the food in that manner? And by food, we're, we're, we're continuing with this analogy of, um, you know, our influence on those who are in darkness. So um, just like salt is a flavor that gets added to the food uh, that influences the taste of the food. So a Christian, a follower of Christ, is an influence to those who he interacts with. But sometimes people don't always appreciate that flavor. They don't want you to influence them, especially not with biblical truth because it cuts against their lifestyle and their uh, mentality or their way of doing things. Uh, but Jesus tells us not to lose our savor. Sometimes uh, there are many out there who you know, are caught up in compromise, who, you know, because it's so unpopular to go against the trends of the world, they tend to want to uh, just kind of fit in and get along. Uh, and in, when, they, when, they, when people do things like that, what's happening is that they're losing their savor. Uh, they're not influencing the way that they're supposed to influence. But Jesus is telling us here not to, in, not to, not to lose our savor, but rather to continue our influence, because if we are not influencing, if we're not um, salting the food, then, you know, if, if salt doesn't have the flavor that, that, that salt has, it's good for nothing. It, it's, it's not useful for anything. He doesn't want the world to influence us. He wants us to influence the world. And I think that that point was made clear. And it can be difficult to do. He recognized that it can be difficult to do when the world is against you and will persecute you because they don't like what you say. But he's calling on us in, in all these words not to lose hope. Now, the next part, um, <clears throat> in verse 16, it tells us, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And so he's telling us again here that he wants others to see our good works. He doesn't want us to hide them. So in other words, um, you know, it, it's kind of like how uh, I remember hearing a sermon a long time ago where this pastor compared uh, Superman Christians versus Batman Christians. You know, Batman typically only came out as, at night when uh, the bat signal was out and uh, he wore a mask. You didn't know who he was. Um, and so he was in hiding for most of the day. Whereas Superman was always Superman. He, he could come out day or night. It didn't really make a difference. And so sometimes Christians treat the gospel like Batman Christians, where we're always in hiding and we don't want anybody to know that we're, that we're secretly Christians. But here we're called to be children of the light, children of the day. We're called to let our light shine. We're called to let people know what we stand for and what we believe, and not, and not to be influenced by the world, but to go out and to influence the world, just like salt influences the taste of food. Next, Jesus goes on to talk about the law. And this is a really interesting section because this has been the cause of so much controversy and misunderstanding within Christianity. Um, there are many people who believe that Jesus somehow in the Sermon of the Mount introduced a new law, which is not true. And, uh, you know, there are many who believe that Jesus did away with God's commandments and that he, in, that he instituted something new through the Sermon on the Mount and that the law no, no longer makes a difference, no longer matters. But if we look closely at what Jesus said here, we'll see that he's actually not putting an end to the law. He's not saying that, you know, the law no, no longer counts. None of God's commandments make a difference. He's actually magnifying the law. But before I read this text, I want to read something to you uh, that comes from a prophecy about the Messiah in the Old Testament. And this comes from Isaiah chapter 42, verse 21. This, this is a prophecy. It says, The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. So one of the things that Jesus would accomplish in his ministry 
is to magnify the law and make it honorable. You can't do that if you contradict the law and you do away with it. So Jesus didn't come to do away with the law, but actually came to fulfill it. In other words, the word fulfill basically means to fill up, to bring it to completion. And not completion as in an end, but to accomplish the purpose of the law, which is, of course, righteousness. So Jesus didn't come to put an end to the law, but came to bring righteousness to the people. Okay, so the law is actually still valid. Now let's take a look at what he had, what he said himself of his own mission. Did Jesus come to put an end to the law, or did he come to magnify the law and make it honorable? Let's take a look. If we take a look at uh, verse seventeen, he says, "Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass." One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So what does this sound like more of to you? Does this sound like Jesus is putting an end to the law, like the law is no longer important, we should no longer keep commandments? Or is Jesus magnifying the law and make it honorable? In Jesus' words here, he's clearly magnifying the law and showing its importance. He's not doing away with it. He's saying that if you, if whoever does and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And he also goes on to say here, that people who do not teach, people who, who, who uh, teach people to break these commandments and disregard them are considered least in the kingdom of heaven. So he's not doing away with law. He's actually magnifying it. He's actually increasing its importance. A uh, comment just came in here. It says, uh, he came not to change the law. That's right. He did not come to change the law. He came to magnify it. And we, we'll see how he does that in the, next, in the next couple of verses. Now, the reason why there's been a lot of... Uh, um, I guess uh, discrepancy about this matter is because uh, you know there have been many churches out there that talk that are talking about uh, us being saved by grace. But being saved by grace does not dis uh, discredit the importance of the law. Uh, there's a difference between understanding salvation by works and salvation by grace. Okay, uh, salvation by works is when you think that because you've done something that you have earned your right to go to heaven, whereas salvation by grace is basically the understanding that. Uh, a person cannot earn their salvation through doing anything. God gives it to them in spite of the fact that they don't deserve it. Now, uh, what place does grace have in, save, in being saved by works? If a person uh, has earned uh, the right to, and through, if, I go to the, if, I, if I work at a job and I, and I agree to work for $10 an hour and I work for three hours and so the, the boss gives me $30 for my three hours of work, I, he's not giving me that money by grace. I've earned it. Now, on the other, on the other hand, the flip side of that, um, is there a place for works within being saved by grace? Well, if a person is saved by grace, in spite of what they have done or have not done, they're receiving um, a reward. Okay? So if a person is saved by grace, they're, they're, they're accomplishing something, not because they've earned it, but they're getting it because of divine favor because God has chosen to give it to them, okay? But now, does works have a place with grace? Absolutely. Works are a demonstration of gratitude for being saved by grace. So in other words, you don't work because you're trying to earn your salvation, rather, but because you have been given this great salvation, because you've been given this grace, you, your works demonstrate your gratitude and your appreciation and your love. So works has a place in salvation by grace, although grace does not have a place in salvation by works. And so salvation, when you look at the entire uh, experience throughout scriptural history, salvation has always been by grace. So even in Israelite history, the, uh, the Israelites and the Jews did not understand themselves to be saved by works. They knew that salvation was always by grace. And so even if you look at, 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 uh, at when they were first given the law, 
First, God had saved them from the land of Egypt, and then he gave them his law. And so when we look at it, God didn't say to Israel, hey, you know, if you guys keep my commandments, I'll bring you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. No, he saved them first. And then after he saved them, he gave them his commandments. So again, you can see right there that salvation has always been by grace. God reaches out to humanity and does for them what they cannot do for themselves. And then in response to that grace, that unmerited favor that he gives them, he, he, he commands them to keep his law. So the keeping of the law is a response to salvation, not a means to obtain salvation. However, even though it's a response to salvation, it's still important. Because, you know, when you do something for somebody and, and you know, you, you, you expect some uh, and you expect gratitude in return, you know, you, you sure don't expect somebody to, to be nasty. I mean, imagine uh, being a, a police officer and, you know, you pull somebody over and the person was speeding and by grace, you give the person a pass and you say, hey, look, man, just make sure you go the speed limit. Don't do this again. If that person goes peeling off and speeding down the highway again, wouldn't you be all the more angry? But what if that person then chooses to be a safe driver from that point on? So in other words, that person's obedience is a response to the grace and to the favor that you've been given, that, that you've given them in spite of the fact that they don't deserve it. And that's the way that God's grace is with us. He gives us his grace. He saves us, even though we don't deserve it, even though our righteousness is as filthy rags. And then in response to that grace, he asks us and he commands us to keep his law. So again, law keeping is a response to salvation. Now, so grace doesn't invalidate the importance of obedience. Grace actually magnifies and makes more necessary uh, obedience. And as we see here, Jesus wasn't doing away with the law. He wasn't saying, okay, now that I've saved you, everybody can live how they want to live, do what they want to do, talk how they want to talk you know, commit adultery, steal, kill, murder, do whatever you like, and don't worry, you're saved. No. In fact, once a person was given grace, they are all the more expected to be obedient. Just like the police officer would expect obedience after he's giving you a pass and not expect you to go speeding off down the highway after he just let you go and didn't give you the ticket. You know, we, we, we kind of treat God like that person who would just go speeding off and peeling off in the parking lot uh, in, in complete contempt of the grace that the police officer has just shown us. We do the same thing because we say, okay, God has saved me. God has, uh, has called me out from darkness. God has given me light. God has saved me. He's given me salvation. He's given me grace. And so now in response to that grace, I'm going to commit adultery. I'm going to steal. I'm going to lie. I'm going to commit murder. I'm going to talk bad about people. I'm going to mistreat my neighbor and do all the things that God would not want me to do. And we call that grace. That doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't. And if we're truly grateful for the salvation that God has given us, that's all the more reason why we should be obedient. And so in response to salvation, we obey God. And okay, of course, like the prophecy said, Jesus, Jesus would magnify the law and make it honorable. And let's look at how he did that. So he says here that whosoever will break one of the least of the commandments and shall teach men so, the same shall be, called, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. He also says that one jot, one tittle will in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And you know what? As I look out my window, heaven and earth is still there. And so Jesus said that one jot, one tittle will in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. Matter of fact, in another version, let me just go ahead and grab it. He says, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. And so since heaven and earth is still here, we are still required to keep God's commandments, not to earn salvation, but in response to salvation. Now, he goes on to say here, for I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the, of the Pharisees and the scribes, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So he wasn't calling for less righteousness. He's actually calling for, for more righteousness. Uh, please explain Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. Okay, let me just go there. Okay, so Genesis 15, verse 6, this is the uh, part where Abraham uh, is, uh, is saved. He says here, and he believed God, uh, sorry, he believed the Lord, 
and he counted it to him for righteousness. So this is talking about how Abraham believed God. Remember that uh, God tells him to um, leave his father's house, uh, to go to a land where he, where he was going to show him. Uh, Abraham had no idea where he was going, but he trusted God enough that whatever God told him that he was going to do, God was going to bring it to pass. Um, you know, it, it, Abraham could have been considered crazy for this big leap of faith that he was taking and leaving his household, leaving his family, and going to some destination he knew nowhere, he, he never been to, he'd never been before, and had no idea where he was going. But because of his trust in God, he believed what God said to him, and he left his father's house, and God counted it to him for righteousness. So Abraham was not the most moral uh, person. You know, he had faults and flaws just like the rest of us. But in spite of those faults and flaws, God credited him with righteousness because of the fact that he was willing to have faith and believe in him. And so um, in verse four uh, of that same chapter, he says here, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him saying, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and, and, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them, he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. Now, in this particular part, uh, Abraham was told that his offspring were going to be like the stars of heaven. You couldn't even be able to count them. And the way that the language is here, uh, if you look at the original language, you'll see that he's actually telling Abraham to count the stars in the daytime, which is impossible. So he's telling Abraham that even though you can't see physically what I'm going to do for you, trust that I'm telling you, your descendants will be like the stars of heaven. Un you'll be unable to number them. And Abraham, even though he had no evidence that God was going to do this, believed God. So his faith was credited to him for righteousness, even though he hadn't done anything in particular to deserve being credited with righteousness. So even as far back as Abraham, God had given righteousness by faith. He, he, was, he was being gracious to Abraham. Abraham was not uh, a perfect person, but rather because of his trust in God, God gave him grace and unmerited favor in spite of the fact that morally, like the rest of us, he didn't deserve it. So Abraham believed God, and by grace, it was credited to him for righteousness. I hope that uh, explains your question. That's pretty much an example of, uh, of what we've been talking about so far um, in that, you know, even as far back as the Old Testament, right? Uh, you know, salvation was never by works, but by faith. Abraham didn't do anything to deserve righteousness uh, or, or the status of being righteous, rather. But in, because of his belief, God was giving him unmerited favor. God was giving him grace in spite of the fact that he didn't deserve it. Abraham had some major flaws. He made some major mistakes. Um, you know, for example, uh, telling people that his wife was his sister. Uh, and if... Uh, Abimelech had slept with uh, with Sarah, uh, or actually, uh, her, name, her name was uh, Sarai at the time, but if, if Abimelech had slept with her, God was going to slay him. So all throughout Abraham's life, we see God giving him unmerited favor. Uh, and so there's nothing that Abraham did to deserve that. But because of his faith, he was credited with righteousness. And then, of course, God began to teach him and work through him. Um, and as he learned, he began to obey God and eventually God brought him to a place in his life where he could bless him and he could start to see the fulfillment of the promises that God was giving to him. But again, he didn't work for it. It was given by grace. So as far back as Abraham, we see that favor is given not because people earned it, but because God chose to give it. So salvation has always been by grace. And in response to that, uh, God requires obedience. When we look as far back as Adam and Eve, God gave them the promise uh, to save them immediately after their disobedience. God says, to, uh, God says to them, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. He says, to, I'm sorry, God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, but thou shalt bruise his heel. What did Adam and Eve do to deserve God offering them an opportunity for hope? They did, they did nothing. God gave it to them by grace. So this whole idea that grace in, invalidates the law is ridiculous because grace doesn't invalidate law. It actually um, increases 
and magnifies the reason why, why one would keep the law. So, I mean, what if Adam and Eve had said, oh, God's giving us hope. He's going to save us. There's going to be a Messiah. Oh, great. Here's what we'll do to thank God for all of his, uh, for all of his, his, uh, his hope and, and benefits that he's given us. Let's go break more laws. Let's go, uh, you know, do things that are sexually immoral. Let's go ahead and do, uh, and, and, and commit murder and uh, adultery. And uh, let's, let's do everything wrong we possibly can so that we can thank God for his wonderful mercy. Would that sound right to you? Does that make any sense? Of course not. Uh, here we see that in response to grace, Adam and Eve were looking forward to the Messiah. So grace didn't take away a need for obedience. Grace increased the, 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 um, the importance of obedience. All right, so going back to our text in Matthew, um, you know, just like we saw in Genesis, like with Adam and Eve, and just like we saw with Abraham, uh, first salvation is 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 promised, it's given. Uh, you know, God has mercy; He gives us grace, and then He requires obedience from us. So, again, you see that theme of how salvation, uh, so how how law keeping is a response to salvation, but not a, a means to obtain salvation. And as we look at uh, Jesus' words, he tells them that uh, their righteousness should exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes. Now, you're talking about the most legalistic sect of people here. Why would Jesus want their righteousness to, uh, to exceed this law-keeping body of people? Um, some people interpret this to mean that this must be God doing away with law. But that's actually not what's happening here. You see, the Pharisees and the scribes uh, outwardly appeared as if they were keeping the law, but inwardly they were doing it with the wrong motive. Okay, so law keeping should ultimately lead us to love others. Uh, grace should lead us, uh, in response to grace, it shouldn't lead to more contempt and hatred or feeling like a person is better than somebody else. Uh, that's hypocritical. Uh, the, the correct response to grace is to love and to and to want to show other people grace. It's kind of like the, the the parable that Jesus told where he was talking about the person who had a servant who owed him a, a, a great amount of debt. And when he forgave that servant of his debt, that servant then went and grabbed somebody else by the throat because that person didn't pay him his debt. And when the master found out what his servant had done, who he had forgiven of all that debt, uh, he then had the person thrown into prison because he didn't show mercy and compassion on others. So here, that person was forgiven of their debt by grace. He had done nothing to earn being forgiven of his debt. The master had chosen to forgive him by grace. He didn't deserve it. He didn't earn it. It was by grace, unmerited favor. But because he didn't show compassion to others, that grace was, was withdrawn from him. And so that's a lesson to us today that if we're saved by grace, grace should lead us to love, especially those who have wronged us. And you'll see that theme appear later on in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself before I address this, this, this matter with the Pharisees and the scribes. So the Pharisees and the scribes were hypocrites. They were people who outwardly appeared as if they were law-abiding, but inwardly they were full of hypocrisy. They said one thing and they did another. And so Jesus basically was telling them that their righteousness needed to exceed the Pharisees uh, and the scribes. They needed to not just be hearers of the word, not just teachers of the word, but doers of the word. So God calls us not to be hypocritical, to teach one thing and then to live another way, but rather he wants us to live that, ex that experience. So to the hearers, they would have thought that the Pharisees and the scribes were the most holy and righteous people. How could we ever exceed their righteousness? What would we, do we have to live as monks? I mean, what do we do to exceed their righteousness? But it was actually easier than it would have appeared at face value. Because if one considered their outward works uh, then it would appear like it was difficult to exceed their righteousness. But if one consider, considered their inward works and their hypocrisy, then it would be a little bit easier because a lot of times these individuals were saying one thing but practicing another. And so Jesus kind of called them in this sermon on their hypocrisy. He was calling for people to worship God and to serve God, not just by lip service, not just by eye service, doing things outwardly to appear as if you're holy, but rather he wanted an inward transformation. You have, heard it said, you have heard that it was said by them of old, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill 
shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother have ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thy with thine adversary quickly, whilst he whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the ab, the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. For verily I say unto thee, thou shalt not thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her have committed adultery with her already in his heart. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee to, that, that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should perish into the hell. I'm going to go on uh, a few further. Um, let's look at verse 31. It says, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his life, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Again, ye have heard, it, heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the, unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is, God, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make, make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than, this, than these cometh of evil. So when you look at these passages, does it sound like Jesus is doing away with and abolishing the law, or is he magnifying it? In each case, Jesus begins to take the law to the next level. You know, he says, you know, it's not just adultery, when you actually commit the, the act of adultery. But if you look on a woman and you lust after her in your heart, you're guilty of adultery. So he's not actually doing away with the law, he's magnifying it and increasing its importance. He's putting the law in its proper perspective and commanding people to keep it. And again, he's not giving new commandments here. He's establishing and magnifying the same old commandments that God had established on Mount Sinai. Um, <clears throat> It's interesting that uh, many people try to say that, uh, you know, God's law here uh, is, is done away with because God was doing away with a system of legalism, uh, with a system of grace. But in actuality, like we just said before, salvation has always been by grace, and it's always been the Jewish understanding that salvation was by grace. So they never viewed their law keeping as uh, a means to earn salvation but rather understood that it was by grace that they were receiving this law and that this, this grace uh, was given by God, though they didn't deserve it. Um, and so in response to that, they were commanded to obey. I want us to take a look at this quote here by, um, this actually comes from uh, Dr. Nash's book, uh, the book of Matthew. Uh, and I'm looking at um, this quote here from Richard Elopher. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, but uh, Richard Elopher. And it says here, it is popular, it is a popular myth that Jews ever believed they were saved by their obedience. The Jewish people don't believe in salvation by works. For the Jews, salvation has always been by faith. Thus, when Jews today enter the church, they continue to believe in salvation by faith, but the faith is about Jesus. When they were in Judaism, the faith was just because they were Jews, but it was always by faith. So, and then uh, there's another quote here from, uh, from Craig Keener, which says, uh, most Jewish people understood the commandments in the context of grace. And then he goes on to say later on, the kingdom of grace Jesus proclaimed was not the workless grace of much of Western Christendom. In, in, the, gospels, in, uh, in the gospels, the kingdom message transforms those who meekly embrace it. So in other words, he's saying here that uh, salvation's always been by grace, but just because the, you're, you're receiving grace doesn't mean, okay, now it's time to do absolutely nothing. But in response to grace, there are works. 
So because of the grace that we've been given in, in Christ, we should all the more be motivated to go out and to proclaim the gospel, to go out and to reach souls for the kingdom of God. You know, so this isn't a workless grace, but if you are sincerely grat um, in, in gratitude for what God is doing for you or what God has done for you, then you will go out and do the things that God desires us to do. And not because you're forced to, not because you're trying to earn something, but out of sheer gratitude and appreciation for the, for the unmerited favor we have with God. So basically what, this, what, what, what we've read so far is saying, salvation, Jewish people have, have not viewed salvation as, you know, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as a means to get to by works, but rather they, always, they have understood that it's by grace that we are saved. So the idea that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount replaces a system of legalism, what God had given them was never a system of legalism. It has always been by grace that they were saved. Uh, but now what Jesus was putting an end to was the uh, rituals and the, uh, the, the ordinances of divine service that were pointing to the fulfillment that they, that they would find in Christ. That's what was done away at the cross, not the law. And Jesus made it perfectly clear here. He couldn't have been more clear that, uh, that, that the law was still binding because he says here, one jot, one tittle will in no wise pass from the law. And he says that whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That doesn't sound like somebody who's doing away with the law to me. So he goes on and he makes a few more statements in the same chapter uh, where he basically is magnifying the law. I want us to go on to... Uh, Micah chapter 6 and verse 6 to 8. So let's take a look at the Old Testament for a moment and let's see what the Old Testament has to say about salvation. So we're looking at Micah chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. And it says, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of, of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what, hath the, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. So here again, we see that it's not really the offerings that, that were saving anybody. God didn't really care for those things. They were a means to, to, to teach the people of Israel. But these things did not earn them any salvation or any favor with God. Unlike the pagans in those pagan religions where when a person offered sacrifice, they believed that they were appeasing the angry gods. But this was not so with, with, the, with the God of heaven. Instead, we find that these offerings were used to teach the children of Israel, but God wasn't really pleased with thousands of rams and thousands of rivers of oil or that somebody would offer their children to him. That wasn't the point. He says in, in, in verse 8, Micah makes it clear that for God, what he really requires of us is to do justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Simple things. He's not requiring anything great of us. And what's really interesting is that before he requires us, before the text says that he requires us to do justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly, it says he has showed thee, O man, what is good. So first God shows us what is good. He gives us salvation. He, 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 he uh, saves us from our sins. He saves us from our captivity. And then he requires us to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with him. So these things are a response to salvation, not a means to it. And if we're truly um, in gratitude for what God has done for us, then these things should be like second nature to us. We should desire to do these things. Uh, it should not be a compulsion that God requires these things of us, but we should do it out of, out of sincere gratitude and appreciation. Uh, 1 John chapter 5 and, uh, and verse 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So in other words, we're not supposed to keep God's commandments as a means to earn something or to keep it, but you know, have contempt for the commandments in heart. Rather, um, if we truly love God as a result of the things that God has done for us, if we've truly been led to love God, then we should be all the more willing to keep his commandments, not from, a, uh, from, from being, uh, not, not doing it egregiously or uh, out of coercion, but doing it out of willingness of heart. So true obedience 
can't come from a legalistic system of, you know, doing things because if I don't, God will fry me. But instead, true obedience is supposed to come from the heart, from the standpoint of gratitude. And that was something that the, that the scribes and the Pharisees didn't do. You know, their, their obedience was just for show. It wasn't really from the heart. And because it wasn't from the heart, it led them to feel like they were better than others. It led them to be hypocritical. And Jesus was saying that their righteousness um, was not a righteousness that his people should emulate. The people needed to exceed their righteousness in order to be in order to enjoy the kingdom of heaven. So uh, true works that are motivated by love should not lead a person to think that they're better than other people, but rather we work because we love. We work out of gratitude and appreciation for what God has done for us. And so God's commandments should be a joy to keep. We should enjoy keeping God's commandments. We should enjoy fellowship with him. We should enjoy walking humbly with him. He wants us to have a relationship with him. So true obedience comes from a relationship with God. Uh, next, it goes on to talk about the principles of the kingdom. So, in order for us to be able to obey, the Holy Spirit has to work within our character so that we can love others the way that Christ loved. And notice that God is indiscriminate in the way that he loves. So even when people are wicked and disobedient, God still shows them his favor. Uh, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48 for a moment. And it says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Now, here in this context, what did Jesus mean by perfection? Was he talking about being sinless here? What exactly did he mean by being perfect? Well, he's talking in the context here about how if you only love people who love you, what good is that? If you only salute people who salute you, if you only do good things for people who do good things for you, then you're no better than your enemies. But he says here, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That's a hard thing to do. That is perhaps one of the most radical things that Jesus said. The idea that somebody that mistreats me is supposed to be somebody that I love and care for and show kindness to. That's radical. Nobody wanted to do that. That's, that's something that goes completely contrary to human nature. We don't treat people nicely who mistreat us. But Jesus was calling for radical re reform. And he tells us, he, he gives us a basis for doing this. He says, the basis for this is the fact that this is what God does. You see, God causes his son to shine on the just and the wicked. So it says here in, uh, in verse 45, uh, that ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven, for he maketh the, his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So in spite of the fact that this planet is in rebellion, God still shows us all kindness indiscriminately. Everybody gets the benefits of rain. Everybody gets the benefits of the heat and the, uh, the nutrients for the plants from the sun. So God doesn't say, oh, because you were nasty to me, now you don't get the rain anymore. Now you don't get the sun anymore. Instead, God shows kindness even to people who are in rebellion against him. He is kind and courteous to those who don't deserve it. And so if we are the children of God, then we need to be like God. And in what way can we be like God? We can be like God in showing kindness to people who wrong us and who don't deserve it. And Jesus equates this in verse 48 with perfection. To be perfect as God is perfect is to show kindness and love and compassion to one's enemies, especially when they don't deserve it. Because God reached out to us when we didn't deserve it. So just like God loves perfectly, being merciful to those who don't deserve it, we too need to be kind and merciful. Now, we're going to take a look at the last part, which is uh, Matthew chapter 13, and we're looking at verses 44 to 52. So we're looking at Matthew chapter uh, 13 and verses uh, 44 to 52. Uh, we're not going to get to cover the entire Sermon on the Mount. I won't get to, uh, to cover everything that's in there. I mean, you could study the Sermon on the Mount for years and never exhaust everything that's there to exhaust. Uh, but this is the last part that I want to focus on for tonight. And it says here, and again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, the which, 
when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy, therefore, sorry, and for joy thereof, goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he hath and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and, and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then in verse 52, he goes on to say, Therefore, every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a, ho uh, that is a householder and bringeth forth out his treasure, things new and old. Now, let's analyze what Jesus is talking about here. Now, in these first two parables, he tells us that the kingdom of heaven is something that's costly, but its value is greater than anything that we could possibly give up to obtain it. So he points out here, basically, he's using this analogy in which he's talking about how if a person buys, uh, finds a treasure on a field and that treasure is extremely valuable, more so valuable than anything that they have, they'll give up everything that they have to make sure that they get that field because they know that the value of the field exceeds the value of everything that they have. So it's kind of like if I have $10,000 to my name and I find a field in which is buried, a, uh, you know, a, a pot of gold, which is worth a million dollars, let's say. Is me giving up my $10,000 worth buying the field so I can get the 1 million? Obviously, yes, because if I get that field, I exceed the value of what I had originally. It's just common sense math. And so Jesus is pointing out here that the kingdom of heaven is more valuable than anything we could possibly have to give up. And so it's worth it for us to give ourselves to obtaining the kingdom entirely. So he's talking about making a complete surrender here and that we need to surrender everything we have and be willing to part with whatever needs to be parted with because the kingdom of heaven is just that valuable. Just like a person would give up all, everything that they have to obtain a greater rich, uh, a, a greater amount of riches, we who have the kingdom of, of heaven to obtain should be willing to separate ourselves from anything that would, would, that would prevent us from obtaining it. Um, because the value of it is much greater than anything that we could possibly uh, want to hold on to. And so the, the kingdom of God will sometimes require sacrifice. Um, sometimes we'll go through hardship, just like he said in the, in the Beatitudes, you know, in the beginning where he was talking about the blessings uh, for being persecuted or for suffering or for mourning or what have you. Um, there are sometimes sacrifices that we make uh, because of wanting to obtain the kingdom. But those sacrifices are all going to be worth it because of the value that the kingdom has. And so even if we're crying now, we'll laugh later. We'll be comforted later. Even if we're suffering now, we'll have uh, many benefits later. Even if we go through uh, mourning and crying, uh, you know, eventually we're going to be in a place where we're well taken care of. Because the value of the kingdom of heaven exceeds the suffering that we can experience in this life. Um, now, in the last parable, he talked about, uh, 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 basically, he used the fishing terminology. Um, and he says in, uh, in, 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 uh, in this last part of the verse, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a, unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. Now, here he begins to talk about the judgment. And when he talks about the judgment, he's pointing out here that um, when a net is cast into the sea, it brings up all different kinds of fish. But not every kind of fish is something that's edible. So some of them, the ones that are good, get, get gathered into vessels and will be kept, whereas those that are not good get thrown back and cast away. In this text, he's telling us that there's going to be a judgment. There's going to be a time at the end of the world where everything is harvested. Uh, the sea represents the world. The dragnet represents the resurrection because it's thrown down into the world and it gathers up. So the dragnet represents the resurrection. And when the fishermen begin to decide which fish they're going to keep and which fish they're going to let go of, that represents the judgment. And so one day God is going to judge, and those who are found not worthy, those who come up short in the judgment, will be uh, punished and, and uh, given eternal damnation, whereas those who are 
uh, found worthy, those who have a relationship with God, will be given life everlasting and will inherit the greatest rich, uh, the greatest amount of riches that one could ever hope to obtain because there's nothing more valuable than the kingdom of heaven. So there is a judgment. Uh, Jesus wasn't shying away from that. He made it pretty clear that there's going to be a judgment at the end of time and that people have to make a decision where they want to stand with God. You know, will we uh, be the fish that's gathered into the goodly vessel or will we be the fish that's thrown, that's, that's cast out and rejected? God wants us to be the fish that is accepted. He wants us to have a relationship with him. And so the Sermon on the Mount let us know that sometimes when we have that relationship with him, yes, we may go through hardship, but in the end, it will all be rewarded and that God has a plan for our lives and he desires to pull us up in the dragnet and to harvest us into good vessels. He, he desires to, to, to take us to, to life everlasting where all the things that we experience in the here and now that have harmed us and that have caused us pain and suffering or anxiety, all those things, all that hardship we went through will be rewarded. So in closing, uh, there are many different takes on the, uh, the the Sermon on the Mount. Many people have tried to over-secularize it. Many people have uh, seen it as uh, you know a symbol of uh, civil ethics and pacifism. Uh, people, uh, Martin Luther saw it as an impossible moral standard that drives us to our knees. Um, people have seen it as uh, a lower set of uh, two levels of righteousness, whereas one uh, was the lower level for regular people and the higher one was for the clergy. Um, you know, there are all different types, types of interpretations uh, for the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus isn't calling us to secular reformation. He's calling us to spiritual reformation. And so one writer puts it this way. He sought to undo the work that had been wrought by false education and to give his hearers a right conception of his kingdom and of his own character. The truths he taught are no less important to us than to the multitude that followed up, that followed him. So here, you know, God was calling them to reformation. He was calling them to spiritual reformation. He wanted them to understand that that that, that heaven had to be the goal. Uh, nothing could exceed the importance of the kingdom of God. I like what Jesus said when he when he when he said, "Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness." and all these things will be added unto you. The, the, one of the focal points to the Sermon on the Mount was seeking first the kingdom of God, putting God first. No matter what the cost, no matter what the hardship, put God first because God has a judgment, and in that judgment, he will reward the righteous and punish the wicked. So with that said, uh, that's all the time that we have for tonight's study. Uh, I got a comment that just came in here. It says here, um, we must give up our earthly possessions and surrender to God fully. Yes. You know, that doesn't mean that every person has to give up everything and sell, up, sell all their riches, sell everything that they have and live on the street. You know, but when you're called to give up something for the kingdom of God's sake and God is calling you to give up that thing, nothing exceeds the value of eternity. Because what God is giving you for the small price of something that you might have to give up, God's, uh, what God is giving you in return it is by far exceeding the value of anything that it might cost you in this life. So yes, I, I agree that, you know, when, when, if we have to give up our earthly possessions, that's just what we have to do. But God is giving us something of great value that no amount of riches that this world has to offer could ever pay for. So uh, with that said, uh, we are ready to end with prayer. And I thank you guys for listening. And I hope that um, we will keep eternity in the forefront of our minds. And remember these lessons that Jesus taught that, you know, if we're going through difficulty now, uh, we will be rewarded for it later. And those who are experiencing, um, you know, the, the things that this life has to offer and are, you know, participating in sin and think that they're getting away with it, there's a judgment coming. And God uh, is going to judge every person according to their works. And works aren't a means to salvation, but they are a product of it. They are a, uh, a response to salvation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for opportunity to study your word and to look at the Sermon on the Mount, one of the most influential, the most influential sermon that was ever preached. We pray, Lord, that you would guide and bless us. Help us, Lord, to put into practice these things that we would not be hypocrites, but that we would live as you would want us to live. Help us, Lord, to be a blessing 
to our enemies, to exercise patience and mercy, just like you exercise it with us. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming, everyone. Good night.